Welcome everyone to Rules Explain. In this episode, or in this season, we're actually going to go over Ogre, the Steve Jackson game from 1977. Or was it 76? 77. Uh, I am John Merritt. I'm Rob Nothing. And let's get rolling. We've got Ogre, 1977. Steve Jackson, the legendary Steve Jackson guy who actually made this game, which I thought was pretty amazing. Uh, because, you know, you hear about the Steve Jackson games and they're always, you know, buying other games. And he came out with this. I don't know. Is Steve Jackson's games a corporation or is it just still his business? It is. Oh, I, I don't know if it's officially incorporated, but it is definitely a corporate entity. They sure. have multiple writers. They have multiple uh, members on their staff and so on and so forth. So I'm not sure if it's incorporated, but it is definitely a major game company. Yeah, and I mean, this is one he actually wrote and created, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, we are love the artwork in this game. Most definitely. Um, we're going over the third edition uh, from 1982. Is it 82? 82, yeah. So in 1977, he was with which company? Was it Meta Games? The history behind Meta Gaming going up to 1982. In essence, Metagaming was another one of those wonderful companies, if I can go ahead and wax nostalgic, yeah. that was trying to go ahead and establish a niche market in this newfound fantasy, science fiction, wargaming, wargaming industry. Obviously, it's just a few years after Dungeons Dragons comes out, and we have established game companies like SPI starting to create their own titles. But there was a tendency for these games to be a little bit out of the price range for your average everyday consumer. So as you can see, the price on this game was a paltry three bucks. And it was two dollars and ninety-five cents. <laughs> and the idea I can't even buy a cup of coffee for that nowadays. And metagaming created they created some traditional box games, but their main line was these micro games. Games that had, uh, they were basically pocket sized and they literally could fit in your pocket. They were just slightly smaller than a trade paperback as far as their dimensions, but they had only about 16 pages, about 200 counters, a fold up map that ended up folding up to about, you know, roughly four times the size of the rule book. Uh, yeah, it was like 13 by play, nine or something. Yes. The gameplay, the playability were all great. And they took on all these crazy ideas and concepts. Ogre, we'll discuss in a few moments. They also had a game about robots that were fighting each other a long time before that was even a thing to talk about. They made a game about a, uh, a, about battles inside of a great living god. Um, they, had, they had games that were set on worlds that were full of crystalline entities. So they created a whole series of, oh, they had a game set on a black hole. It was just a variety of different, you know, weird settings and weird circumstances. Uh, that they found success with. Unfortunately, they did not go ahead and properly compensate or uh, shall we say, even credit Steve Jackson for his work on Ogre and other games. And this would result in a lawsuit, which Steve Jackson would win, metagaming shuts down, and Steve Jackson moves on to fame and fortune and everything that goes with it. And he gets his games back. He gets Ogre and that other game. Ogre, GEV, Melee, Wizards, and the entire Fantasy Trip line. Oh, okay. So the original artist for, for Ogre was Winchell Chung. Mm -hmm. And I've got, I went and I found his website. Here it is. Yes. And these are some of the original drawings he did. Just fantastic artwork. This is beautiful artwork. It really is. And, um, and it's a simplicity, isn't it? It's simplistic, but yet detailed at the same time, which is yes. what I really, really like. You know, it makes the, you know, the, the star of it, the GV, you know, it's, it, it gives it this very futuristic uh, look to it, or futuristic scientific uh a sci-fi feel mm -hmm. you know he talks about when he was in high school and he got contacted and then he did these drawings <laughs> you know here's the mark V ogre uh, combine 
just to go ahead and preview for the, to the listener and the viewer, an ogre is a tank roughly the size of a football field or larger, depending on the model, that is cybernetically controlled and that its prime mission is to go ahead and destroy the enemy. So we'll get more later, but just in case you're wondering what this ogre thing is. He had some, where was it? Here concept it is. Concept drawings, you got some concept. It, oh, there you go. Here yeah. it is, here it is. So here, here's where he was talking about when he was in high school and he got contacted and he just wrote the stuff up. And if you look at the sketch he did when he was in high school, it's kind of the basic cover to the ogre game in a very, very scribbly kind of way. It's got all the concept artwork <laughs> kind of sketched out. I thought that was really cool. I mean, look at that. <laughs> Good stuff. We've got the tank coming over the hill, you know, guns blazing, firing missiles shooting out of it. And it's just a very, very rough, rough sketch. And there's the front cover he did. And here's another uh, Mark, uh, a Japanese ogre. Yes, there are many different models of ogres and many different purposes within those ogres. Little picture, presuming that's him. <laughs> it could be Steve Jackson, I'm not sure. But yeah, just some really, really neat uh, original artwork. So let's get back to the game. And again, just, just so everybody realizes, this is the kind of stuff that just sparked the imagination. I'm going to sound probably like an old man here, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, illustrations that are more modern using the modern techniques are great, they're fantastic, but they almost don't allow you to stretch the mind. They, they, they basically tell you what you are supposed to see. I love these drawings for what they want you to, what they force you to think about, what they, what they want you to go ahead and imagine. So that's my story, I'm sticking to it. So tactical ground combat in the 21st century. Yeah. I love looking at these games, reading them and giggling. And especially when these science fiction years overlap our years. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. we're in the 21st century right now. <laughs> yes. Thanks to uh, the Catholics and their inability to count a century. <laughs> we're always one plus, you know, our, our, our current millennium. Oh, no, I will go ahead and defend the math here. Because technically, when you start with year one, that is the first century, even though you're still in the year one. And then when you get to the year 101, now you're starting the second century because the centuries count from one to 100 and then from no, 101 no. to 200. So technically, the 21st if, century also did not start till 2001. If you were talking of, about, yes, but this is a base zero counting, not a base one counting. No, it's, it's the first century, percent. the first century hasn't started yet until year 100. Then a century happens. Nope. So the way we look at a year, like we say 2000, I don't know what, what, year, what year are we in? 2021, we're actually in year one of the second decade of the 20th century of the second millennium. We, but we call it 2021. Um, oh, you have to remember, there's no such mm -hmm. thing as a year zero in, in, the, in the Christian calendar. In the calendar that was created in the fourth century, there would be no year zero, so it would always be a year one. And the, and the century system was, was used and was created to count in full centuries, and you'd be living, say, in the year two or three mm -hmm. or four or 55. That would be because you'd be living in that first century. And then in the year 101, that would start the counting for the second century and so on and so forth. That's how it worked historically. And of course, nobody knew they were living in the first century because they still right. believe that they were living in the year 800 according to the Roman calendar. But that's another story altogether. Well, there's the Roman calendar. There's also the Jewish calendar as well. Yep. So yeah, that gets to be some, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe we should do it. Which I absolutely love. Next time. <laughs> Or uh, I, rules explained does calendars. <laughs> there you go. That would here, be fantastic. I thought this reference was really cool. 
um, in the Ogre game, he references Starship Troopers. Yep. The book, because the movie hasn't come out yet. Yep. Which I thought was really cool because I love that movie. The book is even better. I will have to grab that book sometime and read it. I, I'm, I'm guilty of not reading the book and loving the movie. For the, for the purpose of, of our conversation, those books all have to do with some sort of futuristic combat. Uh, for the most part, a lot of people could argue with me that Starship Troopers is actually a, a political discussion, but we can have that conversation too another day. But yeah, these are all about futuristic combat. Starship Troopers is mostly about infantry, armored infantry, and the Forever War is about all sorts of different vehicles and tanks. Bolo is about a super tank. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of different um, interpretations of what future warfare would look like. And Ogre is, is, is continuing the tradition of looking at the future of warfare. And hey, just for a quick little flash, um, the game Battletech will take that in another direction. Mm. You know, stealing a lot of concepts from Robotech, but still, you know, what does the future warfare look like for them? Well, it looks like, you know, armored mechs with, you know, two legs and two arms and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we have the introduction, we have uh, the map sheet, the counters. We're gonna, so here's the preference. Uh, so this is talking about the uh, actual game as to the, um, the gameplay setting. So the technology governs uh, strategy, the tank type vehicles uh, considered obsolete by the end of the 20, uh, the tank type vehicle considered obsolete by the end of the 20th century ruled the battlefield of the 21st. Hmm. Yes, the short story of this little um, game fiction is the invention of BPC armor, which is biphase carbide, which is yes, super tough, super that. strong. Here it and is. And it basically reinvigorated and reintroduced the concept of the armored fighting vehicle to the modern battlefield. So now you could have armor that was only a couple inches thick, but the equivalent of feet in, in, in the old terms, using the old types of uh, metallurgy. So yeah, uh, the, so the game fiction assumes that this biphase carb carbide brought back armored vehicles. And then to, in order to defeat these armored vehicles, they had to basically put nuclear weapons on the tips of all these, all these various um, projectiles. There's and radiation warfare, everywhere. Yes. And it became a very deadly, uh, not just a deadly affair for the combatants, but it would transform the landscape, which uh, when we look at the map, you'll understand you know, the landscape itself would be changed with this, you know, basically semi-global exchange of nuclear or semi-tactical exchange of, of nuclear weapons. Yeah, so in the preface, it says uh, four centimeters of BC, BPC jet equipped, four centimeters of BC, BPC jet equipped, it could guard a man for about a week in increased discomfort from shrapnel, background radiation, and biochem agents. However, the cost to equipped infantry reduced to their value. They, will, uh, they were still more flexible and maneuverable than armor, and now they were almost as fast, but they were no longer cheaper. So we have long range, long range nuclear missiles have been uh, expected to make a mockery of conventional operations. That's interesting. So is there weapons in this game more devastating than a nuclear weapon? Not necessarily. What the game fiction assumes is that you won't be able to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles or even cruise missiles any mm -hmm. longer because the anti-missile technology, whether it be uh, defense lasers or whatever, is going to be so accurate, it's going to shoot those things out of the sky before they can do anything. So your only gotcha. hope to go ahead and use a nuclear weapon is to use a nuclear tipped uh, projectile fired from a cannon or a short range direct fire uh, missile. Okay. And by the way, for the reader and the watcher who's interested, there is a very interesting video out there about just such a concept that the United States Army developed called the Long Tom, which fired a nuclear shell several miles and it worked. So in hmm. case you're wondering if this was a, a feasible concept, it was. So we have tank-like weapons, we have tank-type weapons, uh, cybernetic attack vehicles. 
And then the so. ultimate technological development was the ogre. Dun, dun, the ogre dun. required no crew. Ogre was a, an AI, a self-aware cybernetic organism encased within several meters of biface carbide armor. So Very much tough. so, so much so that the only way to defeat the ogre was to destroy its systems. And even after you destroyed its, uh, its motive systems, its weapon systems, the interior of the ogre would remain. It just would be rendered impotent and unable to go ahead and inflict harm. In fact, more than, so that was the ogre. Okay, so we have the ogre, which is the a super tank. Then we have this thing called a GEV, a ground effect vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, came, mm -hmm. there's a whole series of other units that fight that are crewed by human crew. The GEV ground effects vehicle is one of them. There are heavy tanks, light tanks, howitzers, and eventually there'll be mobile howitzers and light GEVs and a whole other sorts of what we call, I guess, relatively conventional armored forces. And as we'll see in the game, the gameplay involves relatively conventional forces trying to take out an ogre at some point. So then we have a battle suit. So, okay, so the introduction. What is this official one slash 285 ogre miniatures for all the vehicles are in the game. Is that scale? Yes, um, one twenty-fifth uh, vehicles are. I'm trying to think of a good reference for somebody. This would be smaller than micro machines. Wow. Um, for those of you who are familiar with GHQ micro armor, that's a that's about one twenty-fifth. Um, the old Space Marine um, epic scale, that wasn't quite two eighty-fifth. I think it was a bit larger or maybe it was 285th. I had somebody would have to go ahead and correct me on that, but it was relatively close. So if you have Adeptus Titanicus, you get an idea here for the scale of the miniatures. Um, the miniatures are currently available again as plastic miniatures from Steve Jackson Games. And they're they're quite nice. I like them. So we start off with the introduction. In the basic game, Ogre is a two-player game representing an attack by a cybernetic fighting unit the ogre on a strategic command on a strategic command post guarded by an armor battalion <laughs> we got one tank attacking a battalion yep. <laughs> and other scenarios battalion. may involve more than two players and or several ogres uh, playing time is between 30 minutes and one hour so it's a great time to play on your lunch break Yes, and that was the hallmark of these of these micro games. You could play them in a very short period of time. And I mean, everything you needed was in this box that you purchased. Yeah. So to set the game up before playing Ogre for the first time, read the rules over once quickly to get a feel for the game, set up the map and counters for the basic scenario, which we will uh, talk about shortly, go over the rules again. <laughs> Uh, by reference to the rules, the maps, and counters, you should be able to uh, resolve any apparent amb ambiguities. Uh, once you feel you have fully understood the movements and combat rules, you will be ready to play. So the basic scenario is representing an ogre being the attacker. So we got one person being the ogre. Uh, he's got one, one unit. The defender gets 20 attack points and 12 armor units. Uh, and we'll talk about the, uh, the attack strengths later on when we get into the actual um, pieces. Uh, 12 armor units and each howitzer, the defender takes counts as two armor units. So there's howitzers in this game as well. Mm -hmm. Very powerful uh, these, but immobile. Yes, that was the one thing I, I did see about that. And, 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 and they have a very long range. Yep. For them. Uh, and the, 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 in addition, all but 20 attack strength points of the defender's force must be a set up on or behind the line drawn between the two center hexes, two crater hexes on the map. So it's essentially so, like a deployment zone. Right. Okay. So it says, in, in addition, all but 20 attack strength points of the defender forces must be set up on or behind 
a line line drawn between the two crater. Oh, I see. They they have to be between the two crater hexes. Okay. Essentially, so you're, you're a good portion of them have to be the in the board. middle of the map. Yeah. So the the rest of it can be outside those two center hexes. They can be further down the map board. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, the attacking uh, player takes a single ogre mark three and moves first, entering anywhere on the bottom of the map. So the victory conditions are as follows. All defending units destroyed, uh, complete ogre victory, command post destroyed by ogre. So this is key. So the defender gets a, a command post. It has no defense, no attacks. Right. If it is destroyed, the ogre wins. Done. That's correct. Uh, command post and ogre destroyed. Marginal ogre victory. <laughs> uh, command post not destroyed, but ogre escapes. Marginal victory. Command post survives. Ogre destroyed is a defensive victory. Command post and at least 30 attack points of defense force survive. Complete defense victory. Which I've never seen happen. So that is a basic game. So you get 20 attack points, 12 armor units, um, yeah, I would actually have to see what that actually breaks. I mean, what does that usually break down to? Are usually we talking like... Up, mm -hmm. Usually ends up being about, you know, six squads of infantry because a squad of infantry is three units. Okay. Um, six or seven squads. And it usually ends up being, depending on the mixture, and there's all, all sorts of articles written on how you should pick your units and what kind of units you should have. Mm -hmm. But you usually end up having probably only two howitzers at most, because uh, that costs a lot. So you usually have one or two howitzers, and then uh -huh. you you go ahead and probably want at least two missile tanks, um, a couple of heavy tanks, and the rest GEVs. This game reminds me of uh, there's a modern game play style called Defense Against the Ancients, Dota. Defense against the yeah. Defense against the ancients, in, in which you know one person attacks, and you have to defend, and that's kind of what this gameplay reminds me of a bit. You know, it's almost like a, no, no, I'm sorry, I, I take that back. Not uh, a Dota, um, tower defense, where basically you just have an oncoming force, and your job is to defend. I mean, this is a very early version of that strategy. Yeah, for, uh, a gameplay. Tactical, That's what this reminds the tactical me of. decisions are, are limited to basically what units are you going to try to destroy first because there's not really much maneuvering to be had. You're just trying to get to that command post as quickly as you can. And blow it up. So yeah, now because, we have an... I'm sorry, go on. I was going to say, yeah, because if you destroy the command post, you get some sort of victory no matter what happens to your ogre. Well, it sounds like, I mean, right. I mean, if the... Command post is destroyed and and ogre escapes. So the game doesn't end once the command post blows up. It looks that way. It looks like and the ogre has to escape, has to get off the map, I assume. Yes. It, yeah, it just goes off the north side of the map. Okay. Right away. So the well, the presumption post... is that the ogre is going on to more targets. Oh, okay. So his job is to get to the other side of the map, basically. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So the command post and ogre destroyed. Okay, marginal victory, but it's, but it's still an ogre victory. So if that yep. command post gets blown up in any uh, fashion, it's an ogre victory. Yeah. Okay. So now we have an advanced an advanced scenario. So play is identical to the basic section except one defense gets thirty points of infantry and twenty armor units. Again. Again, howitzers cost double. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Two, all but 40 attack points of, uh, of this force must be set up between on or between the lines. Uh, three, the attacking ogre is a mark five. So again, there's only one attack ogre. Mm -hmm. uh, four, for the total victory, the defender must destroy the ogre while preserving his CP, his... Um, command post mm -hmm. and at least 50 attack points of his force. Okay. You also have solo play, which I never found to be, I mean, I mean, have you ever played a 
a solo game. I mean, other than a solitaire. I mean, have you ever yes. played? Yes. Really? Can't solo war gaming is a huge tradition. Is it really? Uh, in fact, solo role playing even has a as a has a good following for for many years. Huh. Um, Oh yeah, solo war gaming has many books written about it and many different strategies as far as how you can actually go ahead and and conduct a game without you know already you know biasing one side or the other. And the trick to solo war gaming is is just to pretend that you're both sides or just try different strategies, crazy strategies. Yeah, it's fun actually. I mean, it's not as fun as having an opponent with you, but you can go ahead and create all sorts of you know different ideas. Like for example, let's have an ogre charge. A CP that's defended with nothing but you know howitzers, and mm -hmm. see how, well, how and let's see how well the uh, ogre does. You know you could do all sorts of things by yourself that you probably wouldn't want to do with a, a friend because you'd probably get angry with each other because you'd say, "Oh, you're not playing fair." <laughs> so play balance the basic and advanced scenarios as well as those in section nine point zero two through nine point zero five have been extensively play tested. If both sides use optimum strategies, the victory should go to the more skillful player, regardless of who takes sides. That's pretty interesting. You very rarely I, hear that. I disagree slightly with that statement. Uh, yeah. because just like in any other war game, it can come down to your dice rolls. If you have oh, the most oh, great strategy no and you just start rolling crappy, you're gonna, you're, it doesn't matter. When I was researching this game, I did come across this. It says, however, according to the games, according to the game's designer, that would be Steve Jackson himself, the balance mix of units was not quite right in the first edition. The second edition sped up, sped up heavy tanks, slowed down GEVs, and changed the defenders purchasing from attacking factors to armor units. Everything is considered equivalent except howitzers, which are worth two of everything else. So there was some gameplay balance after the first edition, but I mean, we are looking at the third edition rules. So yes, this would be an accurate statement that it has been thoroughly play tested because we're, we are looking at the third edition rules. So that is our introduction to Ogre. So on that note, did you have anything else you wanna say about the introduction? No, I'm like I said, this is going to be a lot of fun to talk about this. And once we get into the gameplay, we'll be able to show everybody just how tough an ogre actually is oh, and yeah. how it's going to be, you know, just a challenge to create a strategy that will go ahead and end up defeating it. But yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Yep. So hopefully next week we'll go over the map sheets uh, and, and, and counters. Uh, we'll discuss that uh, again. We'd like to thank Ethan for the, the music. He does a fantastic job at it. Uh, you can find us on YouTube as well if you would like to watch the video of this. Uh, we're on YouTube uh, at Rules Explained. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at rulesexplained at gmail.com. We're on uh, iTunes podcast. We're on Spotify podcast. We're on TuneIn. Uh, guys, I'm John Merritt. And I'm Rob Nothing. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Adios. <laughs>